credibility gap. This is Dr. Max Rafferty speaking, and I'd like to wish the credibility gap a very happy anniversary. This is Sidney Skolsky, and I would like to wish the credibility gap a happy birthday, and may they grow old. Uh, this is David Silverglide, national president of the National Postal Union, representing some 80,000 postal workers throughout the country. I wish to take this opportunity to extend to the credibility, credibility gap my best personal wishes for a very successful anniversary and more to follow. Get your news the way the experts do, from the credibility gap. Beginning Monday, January 25th at 6 p.m. on KPPC. Well, knowing the credibility gap, they could be lying, and they could, you know, maybe they're not here at all. <laughs> the sound of stereo. And now this edition of the Credibility Gap News is brought to you by Doughboys, the surplus store with Levi's Stay Pressed Slacks with stores in Rosemead, Bellflower, and La Puente. I don't know why, but every year at this particular ceremony, I have an irresistible desire to ask for a cigarette and a blindfold. been on an intellectual search for truth, or have we been here, uh, as far as the mass media is concerned, have we been here on, on a pursuit of entertainment? Are you I think that this publicity uh, in the case of this magnitude? The, the case of this magnitude, I can, I think we can go through the annals of, of what's happened in Los Angeles County in the last 18 months, and you'll find that this case is of, quote, this magnitude, end quote, only because the district attorney of Los Angeles County wanted to become attorney general of the state of California. There was some politics involved. Also, that the, that the people uh, who, who, uh, who run the mass media wanted entertainment. Politics and entertainment. Those were the villains, as Charles Manson's defense attorney, Irving Kanarek, summed up his reaction Monday to the verdict of the Tate LaBianca jury. Linda Krenwinkel's defense attorney, Paul Fitzgerald, said it was more a matter of locale. The defense could have been victorious, Fitzgerald told a group of apparently disbelieving reporters, had the trial taken place outside Los Angeles. But what about the defense's puzzling tactic of putting on no defense, calling no witnesses? Did Fitzgerald regret that decision? No, I thought about that very carefully, and, and we don't. At least I don't have any regrets about we, we, we tried it the best possible way. We tried to win, actually. Uh, Hope springs eternal in the human breast, I guess. We, we tried very, very hard to win. The prosecution was jubilant. The jury had accepted its every accusation, including, apparently, the bizarre motive of helter-skelter. Clean-shaven Deputy District Attorney Vincent Bugliosi had argued that Manson believed the White Beatles album contained prophecies and commands for the beginning of race war, particularly the song Helter Skelter. To probe this facet of Monday's verdict, we went to the man who should know, if anyone should. We're in the East Chelsea home of Michael Clayton Clark, whom many experts believe to be the hippest man in all of Great Britain, if not the world. On his wall are some of the honorary doctorates in hipness granted to Mr. Clayton Clark by universities whose names, if you read them, would be recognizable. Mr. Clayton Clark, how do you do? How's your sister? I don't have a sister. Sir. Oh, no, that's a very hip way of saying, you know, how's your vibes, whatever the hell they are. I see. Said the blind man. Uh, uh, Mr. Clayton Clark, being the foremost authority on, among other things, the Beatles... Oh, oh, can I correct you on that? Sir? I don't know whether this has gotten over to the States yet, but let me be the first to tell you, the Beatles have broken up, so in the future you should just refer to them as John Lennon, George Harrison, Ringo Starr, and Paul McCarthy. McCartney? Oh, yes, McCartney. Do you know them? No. I do. Oh, well, that's what I wanted to ask you about, Mr. Clayton Clark. Well, he... we met in a pinball arcade not far from India. No, no, no. Three uh, years... the, qu the question had to do with the Beatles in relation to the Manson family. Oh, oh, bet you don't know what Manson means. Son of man. I read that. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, well, assuming that the jury's guilty verdict in the Manson Son case was... Son man. Yes, yes, I heard. Uh, assuming that the jury's verdict, uh, guilty verdict in the Manson yes. case was an acceptance of the prosecution's helter-skelter theory, what light can you shed? Well, as you know, Skelter, Helter was... Uh, no, sir, the, the song is Helter Skelter. There was a song... Oh, I was thinking of the film, which you haven't seen yet, but don't worry about it, because you never will. We're, we're getting to the song. The, the prosecution song. at the Manson oh, the murder... Song, yeah. Yes, sir. The, the prosecution at the Manson murder trial claimed that Manson believed the song had to do with an upcoming war between the races. Is this true? Well, then a lot of people could get killed. And speaking of that, you know, speed kills. I'm sure it does. Now, it now does. Mr. Clayton Clark, what I'm trying to say well, is... Wait, wait, wait. Hold on just for a second. Careful, some of these, it'll blow your mind. Where did you get those? <laughs> I'm glad you asked that. I know Mike Jagger. Well, don't you mean Mick Jagger? No, I mean Mike. I don't know a Mick Jagger. Who's he? Uh, look, sir, could we just stick to the subject? You bet, Daddy-o. Do you think the Beatles were referring to a war between the races in the song Helter Skelter? And do you believe they meant any of their songs to be a call for violence? Hmm, that's a toughie. Well, Bill, I think John Lennon himself answered that very question in a recent interview in The Rolling Stone. What I interpreted from that interview was that we should all go out and kill the pigs post-haste. Well, sir, I read the interview myself, and I didn't find anything in it like that. Hmm. Well, how many times did you read it? Just once. Oh, well, I read it three times, and I recorded myself reading it and played it backwards, and I found out Paul was dead again. But isn't that just like him? Mm. Not only that, but I also found out that the apparent breakup of the Beatles is nothing more than a ruse to prevent more murders designed by the Los Angeles Police Department in association with Tom Donahue Presents Stone Ground, a new group formed... Uh, wait a minute, sir. That has nothing to do with the Beatles. Oh, well, don't be too sure. You know what they say, today's heroes. And uh, there it is, firsthand, from one of the world's hippest men. W would you like to see a picture of me standing next to Liberace? I noticed as I came out that the door was open. And now it's closed. What do President Nixon, Burt Bacharach, Cary Grant, Dan Rowan, the manager of New York's Plaza Hotel, and the president of the Tanya Suntan Oil Company have in common? Well, all of them, if you can believe the Fashion Foundation of America, are the best-dressed men in the country. The 32nd annual such list, this year's survey of custom tailors and designers, hailed Richard Nixon's sartorial splendor in these words. Impeccable in office, President Nixon relaxes fashion-wise when the occasion warrants. But while the president was called America's best-dressed statesman, his possible opponent in 1972, Senator Muskie, was named best-dressed man in government. It's not clear which is the higher honor. Incidentally, last year's best-dressed statesman was Vice President Spiro Agnew. And it occurred to us that the story of how the president replaced the vice president on the best-dressed list has not yet been told. This is the place I was telling you about, Mr. President. Uh -huh. They've really got some neat clothes. Look at those cuffs. Gee, Sparrow, you know, the American Mile has changed. D didn't the tar pits used to be here? How should I know? You're the one that used to live here. That's right, I did. Well, it's good to be home again with a warm fire and hearty bowl full of... Wait a minute, what am I doing in the closet? Mr. President, huh? you're not in the closet. You're in a famous clothing store, Zachary All. Oh, yes, of course. <laughs> Must have been the taco I had for breakfast. Well, well, where's the salesman? I don't know anything about clothes. Well, that's obvious, as you can see from that mirror there. I I'll go get Eddie. He's a personal friend of mine. Take good care of you. Don't go away. <laughs> don't go away. Got to remember that one. Maybe I will put him on the ticket in 72. He's not a bad Joe. He's not even a Joe. He's a Sparrow. <laughs> oh, gee, there's a nice suit. Where's the price tag? Forty-five dollars? Well, maybe if I tell him I'm the president, I can get it for cost. Oh, Mr. President? Oh. Eddie. Eddie, Mr. President. Uh, this is a great honor, Mr. President. You know, a 42 portly walked in here the other day with a 38 cadet. They wanted matching jumpsuits. They got them. You know why? Because we can fit any man, any size. I don't care if you're a short or a long or a portly or a fat. I think we have something for you at Zach Galeol. 
isn't he terrific? Wait a minute. No, wait a minute. I've, I've seen you on television. <laughs> I've seen you on television. Exactly all. Uh, and so has every one of our 35 master tailors. None of them with mistresses. But many of them with seamstresses. Now, after all, I've done for the 42 portly and the 38 cadet. What can I do for you? You're just like you are on television, except you got a body. Forget Wait. about his body. Ask him about his suits. Right. Uh, Eddie. Can I, can yes. I call you Eddie? Oh, yes. sure I can. I'm the president. Uh, Eddie, I'd like something conservative, but with a bold touch. Uh, something like, well, did you hear my State of the Union? Yes, I was wondering why you didn't mention the war. Uh oh, cool it, Eddie. He's a cash customer. Because we're having a war, a war on prices, here at Zachary All. Uh -huh. When you come into my store, as you have, I can see that, you don't have to settle for something just the award winner who's now down on his luck, a 39 skinny. Uh -huh. He said, Eddie, he said, I don't want something that's just in stock. I want something that looks right on me. Huh. Well, what happened? Well, it was closing time, so I sent him over to the May Company. Now, what can I do for you at Zach? Leo. Oh, uh, well, now, I was looking at this suit here. Uh, uh, I'm wearing... No, 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 the one in the hangar. <laughs> oh, that... That threadbare throwback of phony fabric? Phooey! No, Sparrow! No, he's right. That suit is not you. Oh. And nobody wears a suit that isn't them. At Zach Galeo. Well, what if somebody did? I don't know. That's never happened. Because we have 50,000 suits. One just right for you has got to be here. How long are you going to be in town? Until uh, I get a suit. You see, nothing's really happening in Washington now. Yes, and... something is happening in Washington uh, now. Oh. Cold is happening in Washington now. And that means that whether you're a portly tall or a skinny punk, and from the suit you're wearing, I can't tell exactly what you are, but... Well, now, what's the matter with this suit? Pat made it herself. Hey, hey, it's... Mr. President, look at this one. Oh, I'm glad you brought that out, Spiro. You know, just the other day, a professional football uh, look, player... Look, can I try it on? Oh, uh, well, would I sell you a suit without letting you try it on? Okay, where's the dressing room? There isn't one. I would... We've got nothing to hide at Zach Leon. Well, he sure does. <laughs> well, you... Mr. President, let me ask you a personal question, if I may. I like to know all my customers from the inside out before I dress them from the outside in. Do you mind... Do you find the human body disgusting? Now look, just give me the jacket. I'll try it on right here. If the jacket fits, the pants fit. Sounds like our foreign policy. <laughs> uh, well, well, what do you think? With a, with a little presidential seal here on the breast pocket just to let him know who I am? <laughs> I don't know. Turn around. Mr. Sure. President, a famous short author once told me you can't tell a book by its cover. Uh -huh. The only way we'll know if this suit is really presidential cloth is if you put the pants wait, on. Wait a minute. Now, how can I put the pants on? You don't have a dressing room. Well, will it make you feel any better if Spiro and I took our pants off at Zachary Hall? Speak for yourself, Eddie. Well, I don't know. It's highly irregular. No, sir. It's a 40 irregular. Excuse me just a moment. <clears throat> Spiro, look. It's a $200 suit. That's mm -hmm. $20 for you. And if you take your pants off at Zachary Hall, we got it made. Hmm. Well... Here goes nothing. There. All right, I'll take my pants off exactly off. There you are. Well, I guess if Pat were here, he'd do it. Okay. <clears throat> here we go. You know, George C. Scott once bought a pair of stretch socks. All right, give me the pants. Exactly. Just give me the pants. Oh. There we go. Wait a minute. These don't fit me at all. No, sir. They're my pants. Hey, we Eddie, with your pants off, you don't have a body. Here, Mr. President, here are your pants. Those are my pants. Oh, wait, just a minute. What, what? Hey, now, you said you could do, we could do this quickly, Spiro. Just just give me my pants, and let's get the hell out of here. There's a Robert Hall in San Clemente, you know. Okay, I, these are your pants, aren't they? No, uh, no, no, Spiro, those are my pants. my pants. Eddie, don't grab. Well, yeah, Spiro, I'm embarrassed. A husky halfback is Eddie. watching my pants. <laughs> those were my pants. Uh-oh, Spiro. Mr. Will... President, this is most humiliating. You're telling me... Patton wouldn't have done this. Uh, if you'll follow me, sir, I, uh, I think one of our 35 master tailors can give you a towel to wear on your way out of Zachary Hall. Come on, Mr. President, let's go. Oh, uh, sir, uh, just yeah. one more thing. What's that? Uh, would you mind if I used your name in a commercial?
You and I have run out of time. are the sounds of our year at Pasadena High School. K-P-P-C, Pasadena, rock! It'll make you cool. Ra, 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 Be true to your school. Ra, 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 this is all the new Ra, 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 ra this edition of The Credibility Gap has been brought to you by Doughboys, the surplus stores with Levi's Stay Press Slacks, with stores in Rosemead, Bellflower, and La Puente. Remember when Sergeant Bilko used to take the platoon's money and plow it into a gala month-end dance? Well, Bilko's back on television, and January is almost over. So on Friday and Saturday nights, January 29th and 30th, the great hardwood floor of El Monte Legion Stadium will reverberate to rocking and rolling once again. Helping you say goodbye January, hello February will be Big Brother and the Holding Company with Nick Gravenitis. Oh, I'll change your flat tire, Don Sugarcane Harris, fresh from a while with the John Mayall Band. And Jesse Davis, who used to play lead guitar for Taj Mahal until, like the Rolling Stone ads say, his father painted the cover picture for his first solo album. Tickets are $3.75, sold only at the door. Parking is free, so you know Bilko's not involved. There's no age limit, and the doors are open from 7.30 to 1. January 29th and 30th at El Monte Legion Stadium, Big Brother, Sugar Cane, and Jesse Davis play for dancers only. Can spring be far behind?